All right, thank you, Babette, for the introduction, and thank you for the organizer for inviting me. I'm really excited to, to be here with you. Thank you also to Bernard for this awesome talk, actually very helpful for to start my context and introduction. <laughs> so, well, um, I'd like to bring the discussion to, to local rheology, especially uh, I would like to talk about uh, the viscous to inertial transition in dense granular suspension. I was working in collaboration with uh, me, Chara, in uh, University of Tokyo, Olivier Poulikin at uh, Ex Marseille Université, and Elisabeth Watzeli at uh, Université uh, Paris Cité. So then let's start for uh, the, uh, the case of viscous suspension. So what, what is a uh, viscous su suspension in our case? It's going, to, it's going to be a neutrally buoyant, non-colloidal, monodispersed hard sphere emerged in a viscous fluid. So in this case, the scaling of the shear stress is going to be viscous. That means shear stress tau is proportional to gamma dot, uh, which is the shear, stress, uh, shear rate deformation. Then gamma dot is amplified typically in the viscous scale by the viscosity of the solvent, and also amplified by a dimensionless function. We call it uh, eta s, is the shear granular viscosity which is a solely function of the packing fraction. So then, since the seminal work of Einstein, uh, many experimental work, uh, numerical work and theoretical, some theoretical, trying to explain what is sketched in, in this uh, illustration. So the evolution of eta s as a function of packing fraction. Two important things we can, we can see in this illustration. The first one is uh, eta s is a monotonous increasing function of phi. The second one, eta s also has a asymptotic behavior to a maximum packing fraction phi. After this, after this value, what we what we are measuring is the elastic response of the granular media. So the less work about uh, this in, the, in these fields, it was trying to understand and describing this asymptotic uh, evolution. So then this is uh, viscous suspension. And then what happens when we don't have a fluid inside and we have this frictional dilatant, many times uh, gravity driving granular uh, flow, uh, which, in which we can define two different, two interesting aspects. One is that under, uh, under flow, this granular system present volumetric changes. And the other one, the isotropy of the, of the stresses, as we saw in the previous uh, work, leads us in an additional stress scale, which we call it the granular pressure P. Granular pressure P in this case. So generally speaking, this uh, dry granular system is very well described by um, two dimensionless quantity. The first one is going to be the effective friction coefficient mu which is defined as the ratio in between the shear stresses and this granular pressure. And the second one is the packing fraction, which uh, is both of them are a, a function of this inertial number i. So then taking this granular as, uh, framework and coming back to the suspension where we have a viscous fluid in there, we can try to rewrite these uh, dimensionless uh, quantities but now as a function of this viscous dimensionless shear rate J. So typically in a pressure imposed or boundary condition, dimensional analysis implies that the, this particle pressure P and gamma dot, the shear rate deformation, do not affect the flow independently, but through this, this number. So then coming back to the volume imposed the rheometry, we can again write the, uh, the same scale as before, connected the shear stresses in a, in a linear proportion with the gamma dot, and we give exactly the same, the same viscous scaling for this granular uh, pressure. So what we have now until, until here in terms of dimensionless numbers. So for a dry granular system, you have this inertial number, which is not but the ratio in between two stress scales. One is this inertial stress scale or kinematically stress scale, 
and this, uh, over this external confinement pressure P. On the other side, in over damped uh, suspension, we have this viscous dimensionless number J, which is uh, the ratio in between the microscopic viscous stress scale eta F gamma dot over the external confinement pressure P again. So what we would like to explore in this work is the transition in between these two regimes. Uh, to do so, we will perform some uh, experimental study. This is our experimental setup. It's a custom-built rheometer enabled to perform both pressure and volume impose by uh, by using a, sorry by using a feedback system connected to the top plate in order to impose either the pressure or the sample either the volume by controlling the gap in between the top and bottom, uh, bottom plate. So the bottom plate is a cylindrical uh, uh, geometry which is enabled to rotate at constant uh, angular velocity controlled, controlled by a DC motor. The top plate is porous enabled to the fluid pass through it but not the particles. Both of them are especially rough to impose the boundary condition. I'd like to mention it that in, 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 uh, in the following experiment that I will show you, in every time we have a neutral buoyancy condition except by the dry granular system, and also we have a steady state flow. So then let's start with pressure repose rheology over uh, to explore the, in, both, in both cases, in inertial dry, dry granular media and in viscous over damped suspension. So we will explore the um, asymptotic behavior in every, uh, in both cases, in the effective friction coefficient and the packing fraction for, for both of them. We can see that in, in the case of dry granular media, we have a linear relationship with the inertial number. However, in the case of overdamped, overdamped viscous suspension, we have a root square relationship with the viscous, uh, viscous number. Additionally to this, we can see that independently if the particles are immersed or not, we have exactly the same critical values close to the jamming transition. So that means it doesn't depend on the fluid. By using exactly the same rheological data, rheological data but now expressing our, our data in terms of the viscosity, by normalizing the shear are normal stresses but it's corresponding scaling, in this case, inertial dry granular media, by normalizing by the Bagnoldian uh, scaling and, this, and the, in the viscous suspension by the viscous scale, we can see that the asymptotic behavior for both is exactly the same, a power law function minus two, so in the vicinity of the, of the jamming transition. So then, our goal, finally, is to understand how we transit from something which is overdamped in a viscous suspension to something which is much more inertial in a dry granular system. And we will describe this transition by using the Stokes number, which is not but the ratio in between the kinet uh, inertial stresses over the viscous stresses. So here we have a well-conducted volume imposed rheology over P over PMMA particles of particle size order of five millimeters. So then by normalizing our shear and normal stresses by the viscous, uh, by a viscous uh, scaling and plotted again the Stokes number, we can see the following, the follow uh, conclusion. So for Sto particle Stokes number lower than 10, we can recover the Newtonian regime for both shear stress, shear uh, viscosity, and normal viscosity. Then close, close to this region, close to the uh, Stokes number uh, equal to 10, we have a smooth transition from Newtonian to continuously shear thickening. And then for largest value, we see we recover again this Bagnolian uh, regime in which eta S and eta N scale linearly with the stock number. However, something interesting happened uh, in the transition is that the shear stress transit less 
thickly, it's, it's less abrupt than the normal stresses. And uh, what we can, the, the way to see it more clearly is just plotting the effective friction coefficient as a, as a function of the stock number. So we can see that the effective friction co coefficient in the Stokes regime is a, uh, is a, represent a plateau, and then we have this friction coefficient weakening. So then we try to compare our rheological data by, with the, the data reported by Bagnall in 1954. And uh, we happily see that we have exactly the same experimental result for a completely different experimental device and different particles. Uh, the particle size is the order of one millimeter. And Bagnall tried uh, immersed in water and in glycerin. So then, we would like to be more precise to, to find the crossover from this Newtonian viscous uh, regime to this Bagnolian inertial regime by, by um, rescaling the eta S and eta N, and eta N, sorry, by uh, the viscosity of, uh, but it's viscosity when the stock numbers go to zero. And we can see a very nice collapse of the curve that uh, mini, uh, very, this very nice uh, collapsing, showing that the crossover from, from this viscous to this inertial regime actually happened for a transitional stock, uh, uh, transitional stock number equal to 10, which is independent on the packing fraction. In a qualitative agreement with numerical simulation of frictional sphere, finding a trans transitional stock number a little bit smaller. So then, by performing pressure-imposed rheometry uh, over this, the exactly the same suspension than before, we, we can find that the packing fraction is actually governed by a single dimensionless number based on the stress additivity, defining this K number, which is only a combination in between this viscous number and the inertial number, connected with a alpha phi, which is not more than the inverse value of the transitional stock number equal to 10. However, it's not possible to collapse the data by using this scaling. Um, and this inability to collapse the data is much more clear to see when we, when we plot the friction coefficient of the, uh, of the suspension as a function of the packing fraction. Both of them are normalized by the critical values. So what we can do in this case, we say that well, we can probably to find a better collapse just to fit in the data. And, and what, we, what we got is that the friction coefficient is actually governed for a similar K number with bigger value on the transitional stock number. So one important conclusion from here, and it's interesting probably to explore uh, later with uh, Bernard, is that these two different collapsing rheological uh, data are not cap uh, captured for any numerical simulation for frictional particles. So then, finally, for pressure in post rheology, we have two different, uh, two different asymptotic behavior, which are pretty close. However, they are they have different, different characteristic uh, Stokes number alpha mu, alpha, alpha phi. So then by combining these two equations, we get a, a new constitutive law for the effective friction coefficient as a function of this packing fraction and the Stokes number, which fits very well from this pressure imposed to the volume imposed rheology uh, show it previously in the, in the volume in the, in the experiments. So then one of the conclusions is that uh, the shear and normal stresses can be normalized by the addition of the stresses, uh, the viscous stresses and pneumatic stresses in this way, leading in two new constitutive equations for the shear stress and normal stresses. Uh, another, imp another important conclusion is that uh, independently on the nature of the particle at, at that time, it must be a frictional particle, and independently on the interstitial uh, viscosity of fluid, we have exactly the same 
divergence C across the viscous to inertial regimes. So then this, this conclusion leads us that this transitional uh, shear rate deformation is independent on the packing fraction close the transition. Close the, sorry, close the Jami transition. So I'd like to summarize uh, my conclusion here. We, one of the main conclusions of this work is that the transition from, in, from this to inertial regime actually happened for a given Stokes transitional Stokes number equal to 10 and it's independent on the packing fraction for frictional spheres. This slower transition in the stress compared with P embedded uh, in a mu phi, mu phi and additionally a Stokes number function which describes the anisotropy, the anisotropy of the stresses. And finally, phi is governed by a single dimensional number based on the stress additivity the same case for the friction coefficient, except by a different uh, stock number, which is characteristic of uh, order to 100. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Franco. So, uh, question? Yeah. Thank you for the... Thank you for these wonderful experiments. I, I'm, uh, I'm just wondering, the parameters that are being fitted to the, uh, to the experimental data, how general are they? Uh, can, can they be uh, related to particle properties so that it could be characterized for any, sure. any system? Sure, I, I went a little bit fast in that. So, um, for example, in the case, in this case, when I introduced the uh, dry granular media uh, rheology and uh, viscous suspension, we use this slightly rough origin uh, sphere. So what we got is that we, uh, this sphere is, is naturally rough, naturally uh, frictional. Um, we have, uh, we measured the uh, interparticle friction coefficient, the rolling, the rolling uh, coefficient, and we compared this data in different Condition. So we, we can see that in the, as in, in the close to jamming, the fluid has not an important role in the, uh, in the divergency. And then this, is, this, this was uh, in dry and this was immersed in, in polyethylene glycol. Later, we try different spheres. This is PMMA sphere immersed in Yukon oil. So the conclusion is that we perform all the, all the transition using these particles, but then when, when we collapse all the data here, we have everything inside. This is dry system immersed in PET, in, in polyethylene glycol, and uh, polystyrene immersed, and PMMA immersed also in, uh, in Yukon. So if, um, if the particles are frictional, this is mostly a general uh, result. So there is still some 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 question about the contact. This is this is something that we can we can solve. But if it's frictional, it could uh, it should work in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very uh, enlightening. And also, I'm, I just really have a question about this different Stokes number for the two different uh, for the nor for the mu and can you mu and phi? Yeah. Yeah. So can you go back to the data there? Uh, well. I guess that's fine because, so it appears to me that, that the, so you were saying, I think, that the shear stress transitions more slowly, right? It seems much less abrupt. And to me it looks as though you essentially just get to the completion of the transition at the end of your data in the shear stress, right? It's about a Stokes number of 100, mm -hmm. which is roughly where you're taking this value. Yeah. So, so it's, do you have any insight as to what's going on to, oh. to cause the, the difference in the transition between the two? Well, yes. Why we the normal have, stress transitions more quickly? We, have, we, have, uh, we can have some guessing about this, but we don't have uh, empirical information, but probably it's becoming from the nature of the contact. So actually, the difference in between uh, the shear and normal stress is, is that uh, this is, if you, we can see it like, uh, 
uh, this normal stress is responsible is responsible of the dilation of the system, and the, the other one is the tangential contact. So probably there is some different nature in between them, but I, I don't know exactly what could be the nature who who gives this uh, this uh, friction coefficient weakening. But it could be uh, something in the contact that uh, we are we not we are not capturing in the experimental uh, setup. If, I know it's, uh, if I can just, just please. add one little thing, the, the mu, which is decreasing, it actually the anisotropies of stresses, and uh, it could be that there is a structure which is differing in the viscous regime and in the inertial regime, and oh, yes. clearly this is not captured yes, yeah. by the numerical simulation which has been done to look at the transition. But this numerical simulation may not yeah, as you, have as a complete uh, understanding of the hydrodynamic, which I, we don't know. Yeah, so and that's call, why we can, uh, we dis the for, yeah. yeah, that's why we discuss with Bernard. So just one comment is that um, it, it may be a different transition, but the the shear thickening regime also shows a decrease in oh. the in the um, friction coefficient. bulk fr the bulk friction okay. coefficient, yeah. right? And I don't have any uh, more understanding except no. to just say that's the fact. No, no. Have you looked at the case where the volume fraction is out of equilibrium? So you're going to get some sort of slips. So the volume fraction has to evolve towards this equilibrium value. So you get Come again, sorry, it's slipping. Have you looked at the case where the volume fraction is out of equilibrium? You know, so the, 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 the grains are either dilated The transition and the regime. We, we, uh, I don't think I understand the question. Could you rephrase it, please? Sorry. Well, yeah. most of the stuff you're, you've been talking about is where the volume fraction is at equilibrium. So in many natural cases, it's going to evolve towards that. You might start with a dense flow that then starts oh, reducing the volume fraction. So you've got negative, you know, you got effectively like a volume viscosity, I think of, or whatever. Or slip, oh, slip so you mean a, a tra transitory, uh, yeah. transitory? Yeah. Well, well, we don't have actually the, the data for that, but probably, yes, we, when we were running the experiment, we can see that uh, there is some different characteristic time, uh, time scale that we can change uh, when you when you're looking at the transitory but we don't have we are not able to quantify this because we have this time scale coming from the suspension and also coming from from the experiment so in, in this case from the device what we have is uh, actually a mix in between them so we cannot report it uh, differently yeah there is a transition regime but you know you have some flexibility of the experiment mm -hmm. which is also uh, coming into yeah, in, so into this Time scale, so we don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ever heard? Yeah. So Ben Hart has shown us two movies uh, at the beginning of his talk. Uh, you might remember this wonderful movie of all this running concrete, basically just coming down the, the river or sand or mud. Where is that in this phase diagram? It's in the inertial regime. I mean, what stock <laughs> numbers would you? Where would you put it on this on these plots? It's for me or for? <laughs> Uh, uh, well, I don't know. Is, yeah, <laughs> just, I'm naive. I, I, yeah, I well, this is, this is exactly. you make it wonderful, but where would this natural flow? It would it be in the inertia regime? From I don't know what the shear uh, rates uh, are. This is exactly the point. This is exactly the point. Inertia regime, right? Yeah, that was, that was okay. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. the idea is to uh, to so to fix the stock the stock number and 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 I place see. it in the yeah. At, at those kind of concentrations and flows for debris flows, the transitions probably of around several millimeters. Seven mil several millimeters it would be the transition from viscous to inertial for like oh, a dense a few millimeters debris flow. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so any more question? Okay, thanks, Franco, again. Thank and thanks to all the speakers of uh, this morning session. So we have lunch and then we come back at 2 p.m.